Well, good afternoon. If I can ask you to take your seats, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Ian Whitaker. I'm the uh, Director for Strategic Content at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. On behalf of the Council, thank you all for joining us today. I'm sure it might be the second Council, of the pro uh, council Program of the Day for many of you. Um, like Secretary Albright, uh, Edward Luce has written a book that has caught the mood of the moment uh, when democracy and liberal political values appear to be under great strain. So we look forward to hearing uh, Edward's thoughts on how we got here and, where it might, and what might come next. Um, by way of housekeeping, please know we're on the record. Uh, we're live streaming this event. Please silence your phones before we begin. Uh, please know that views of individuals uh, expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Um, thank you to our members in attendance today. Your support is critical to our work. If you're not a member, please consider joining. We have a wide range of levels for you, for you to choose from. Um, today's remarks will be followed by audience Q&A, and I'll come back up to moderate that. Um, we'll take questions from in the room and also from our online uh, browser-launched app. That's at chi.cnf.io. If you type that into your browser, you can ask a question, you can vote on other people's questions as well. And um, at the very end, we welcome you to join us for a networking reception, uh, where Edward Luce's book, The Retreat of Western Liberalism, will be available for purchase and signing from our partners at the bookseller. Uh, now, very briefly, to introduce our speaker. Um, he is the Washington correspondent and commentator at the Financial Times, where he writes on American politics, the economy, and foreign policy. He's worked for the FT since 1995, including time as the Philippines correspondent, the capital markets editor, and the South Asia bureau ch chief in uh, New Delhi. He's the author of three books, including The Retreat of Western Liberalism. So la la ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Edward Luce. Thank you um, very much, Ian. Uh, and everybody, as, as, um, as Ian knows, um, it's not just a pleasure to talk at the Chicago Council, it's a greater pleasure talking here than all the other places put together. And, and there's one reason for that, which is that uh, the Vice President and Head of Programs here is my wife, Neve. Um, and, uh, but she still maintains, she still maintains a very, a very meritocratic uh, mindset in terms of the speaker selection, so I don't want you to get, don't want you to get um, the wrong idea. Now, when we when we chose this date um, to talk for my paperback launch, this book's been out for about a year. Um, we couldn't know um, that a it would be the sunniest day in Chicago of 2018. Um, B, that uh, Madeleine Albright would be talking in the morning, and C, that Jim Comey would be talking in the evening. So I'm really, really pleased to get, get some of you out. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on top of that, you know, this, uh, as I think Ian intimated, um, it, this is not a very cheerful, spring-like, upbeat topic, um, the retreat uh, of Western liberalism. I'm um, not Irish myself, but being married to an Irish, um, you know, I, I uh, have an enduring sense of tragedy that sustains me through those brief moments of joy. Um, and I can't promise you with this talk, to quote, of course, to steal from Yeats, I can't promise you with this talk that you're going to be skipping out into the spring day, but I, I will try and give a, a, an objective and neutral talk. Um, let me also sort of mention, I did go to Madeleine Albright's um, really really wonderful um, event this morning. Um, and her book, Fascism, A Warning, is, is a lot more Irish in that sense than the retreat of Western liberalism. So this will be a slightly less depressing, uh, less depressing message, I hope. And finally, I should also mention that I spent last week, as did Neve, um, with Ambassador Faye Hartog Levin, who's here somewhere. I don't know, there she is at the back, um, in Israel, never having actually been um, to Israel before, and uh, amongst the many things that we saw and people we talked to, uh, I, I will never forget the morning this time last week that we spent at Yad Vashem, the, the Holocaust uh, Museum, which uh, is, is an extraordinary and, and deeply sobering um, experience, particularly in a week like last week, where, which began with the uh, thumping but not at all surprising election victory of Viktor Orban in Hungary um, after probably the most overtly anti-Semitic campaign in a Western democracy since the, the 1930s. And it, and it did make me think the timing of being there, 
um, that the center on which democracies really rely, the glue that keeps us together, um, has been fraying and in some places collapsing really across the board. Um, you look at social democrats and centrists in Italy uh, in the elections last month at the beginning of March, uh, almost two thirds of the vote went to the right and the far right and the establishment right represented by Berlusconi. He's the safe establishment guy um, nowadays. Germany, they're a ghost of their former self, Austria, uh, and many other countries, and including Israel, um, it ought to be mentioned. The Labour Party is a shadow of its former self. So many people think that the crisis of democracy, the, what I call the retreat of Western liberalism, began in 2016, and I believe that that's quite wrong. Um, I think what happened in 2016 um, was that the fire had been raging for quite a long time, or at least it had been burning. Uh, what happened in 2016 is that we put the arsonists in charge of the fire brigade. But the fire had been there uh, for a long time. I, I often mention, but on the night of Brexit, um, there was an immortal New Yorker head headline by the um, sketch writer Andy Borowitz, uh, which was, Brits lose long-cherished right to look down on Americans as dumber than they are. Um, and then I follow that up with, um, on November the 8th, America leveled the playing field. Um, but uh, it, it, this is a crisis that began long before 2016. It's structural, it's deep, and it will continue, I believe, um, after Donald Trump has left office. This is something we need to grapple with a, a bit more seriously. Um, so let me really divide the whole theme into two, uh, two chunks. Uh, the first is the crisis without, the global crisis of democracy. Um, and the second is the crisis within. Um, starting from the crisis without, uh, Francis Fukuyama calls this a, a democratic recession, what we're going through globally. Um, he, as most of you will know, in 1989 wrote that very famous uh, national interest essay in which he called the end of history, that we'd basically come to the end of the ideological line uh, and we were um, going to settle into this pattern where liberal democracy was the, the standard model uh, for, for everybody, every society to aspire to or choose. And that, that year was my final year at university late November, sorry, 9th of November to be precise, uh, 1989 was when the Berlin Wall fell, when Checkpoint Charlie opened, uh, forgive me, when Checkpoint Charlie opened, I heard about this with a couple of friends, three friends, and we got a train to Dover, uh, took a ferry from Dover to Zeebrugge, and then drove very rapidly from Zeebrugge to Berlin up the Autobahn, no speed limits in those days, got to Berlin and partook in what I call this historic orgy of vandalism on the Berlin Wall, getting a chunk of, our, uh, uh, of, of the wall apiece. Um, and we were very much, and this is where I begin the book, we were very much within that Fukuyama sort of paradigm of believing that this really was, if not the end of history of events, of accidents, the end of any argument um, over what kind of political system we should choose and what kind of political system uh, the rest of the world should aspire to. And the very places we worry most about now were the ones were, that were out on the streets almost exclusively peacefully, if you exclude Romania, look at Poland, look at Hungary, look at the Czech, Czechoslovakia then, and so forth, um, in endorsing, embracing um, the liberal democratic model. And the 1990s continued very much along that vein. If you look at a sort of chart of the number of democracies worldwide, it expands throughout the decade, as you would have expected. Uh, but then something happens around the year 2000. Uh, since then, uh, 25 countries, some of them very serious countries, um, that were democracies at the beginning of the century have ceased to be democracies. 
obvious ones like Venezuela, other obvious ones like Russia, um, you know, whatever you think of Yeltsin's fairly oligarchic set up in the late 1990s, the trajectory was clear. It was getting more democratic. Uh, Turkey, I don't think can be described as a democracy anymore. Thailand has had a coup, which is a very old fashioned way of ending democracy. Nowadays, you usually end democracy through democracy um, and so forth on every continent in the world. This democratic advance has been checked and reversed to the extent that Fukuyama himself now calls it um, a democratic recession. And I think the explanation for this um, can really be couched in terms of three giant political windfalls uh, for China. Uh, the first is how we responded to 9-11, uh, the West's response to 9-11, um, which involved, as you know, things like the Patriot Act, the watering down of very basic Western rights, of habeas corpus rights, um, that tarnished our model in the eyes of others. But more importantly, the uh, false pretenses on which the Iraq war um, took place. And whilst we were prosecuting this ill-fated war, that I think the more time goes on, the more catastrophic a mistake we see that it was, um, China continued to grow. It watched us spend between a trillion and four trillion dollars, depend, depending on how you do your accounting, um, and, and not to waste its money on, on wars of, of choice. Of course, under Obama, we had the Arab Spring, but Obama, because he'd come uh, to the nomination, as well as to the presidency, through having opposed the Iraq War, was deeply ambivalent about democracy promotion. So the Arab Spring, partly because of lack of American support, turned into Arab winter. And the only um, example of a country in the Middle East that remains um, democratic in some form is where the Arab Spring began, namely Tunisia. So, the first sort of big geopolitical windfall was 9-11 and how we responded to it. The second, uh, and I think a uh, more important one, was the crisis of 2008, the financial crisis, beginning with the collapse of Lehman Brothers, uh, and uh, the, the um, resulting um, recession that we, we called, we still call a global recession, but it was actually an Atlantic uh, recession. China kept growing um, at double-digit rates. Other countries um, in the developing world did too. And that gap, that geo-economic gap between the weight that we as, as the West account for in the global economy um, and that the non-West accounts for, that gap widened faster than it would have um, in, uh, in the post-2008 era. And it continues, it continues to widen. So at the beginning of this century, uh, the American economy was about six times larger than the Chinese economy. Um, and it's now about 25% bigger. Um, this in the space of 18 years is unprecedented in human history. So it's the geoeconomic shift, which China exploited and continues to exploit in terms of um, spending on soft power primarily. It is, it is building up its military, um, but um, the spending on things like Confucius Institutes and CCTV bureaus um, and other sort of arms. Of course, there's the Belt Road Initiative, which is considerably larger uh, in real terms in today's prices than the Marshall Plan. Um, these kinds of things, in addition to um, Chinese growth rates, have shifted the relative attractiveness of the political model um, that countries in Africa, Central Asia, Latin America, etc., are looking at. The Chinese authoritarian model of development got a very, very big boost from the aftermath of 2008, uh, and uh, it continues to exploit that boost. And the third sort of major geopolitical windfall, uh, which is what I began with, was the events of 2016, the election of Donald Trump, um, Brexit, and other sort of uh, political democratic aftershocks we've seen in elections since then, which I'll get on to um, in a moment. Uh, I, I, I'm not a sinologist, um, but I have colleagues in China and some friends in China. And uh, when you talk to people who know China, particularly those who know the pro-democracy groups within China, uh, it cannot be uh, overstated what a shock the Trump election was. Because the argument that 
Chinese dissidents have always made, Chinese pro-democracy groups have always made, um, is that generally we make the right choice, that you can trust the people. You can trust that, and you can you know, argue with uh, Chinese, pro-democracy Chinese, any election um, in, in America since you know, 1972, McGovern, Nixon, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Senior, Clinton, uh, and so on, and they will argue, look, the American people chose correctly, and that sort of, that their legs were cut from them in 2016, um, because Trump is, is clearly not what you would expect um, to be the outcome, to put it mildly, of a, a, a democratic contest lasting more than a year in the largest, longest running, wealthiest democracy in the world. So that's been a windfall, and I think those of you, um, which I would imagine is everybody um, who've been following Xi Jinping's extraordinary um, aggrandizement of power um, and personality cult, uh, and wondering why there isn't more reaction against him, why there isn't a greater um, backlash against this new personality cult in China, um, will think, well, obviously this is because of control of electronic media, of Weibo, et cetera, and of monitoring of citizens, and that is true. Um, and that's part of the explanation that there's a chilling effect there in China. But the other part of the explanation is it's much hard, harder in China or elsewhere to argue that democracy is the best system right now. Um, and so I think that's, that's very important. So when you ask, will Francis Fukuyama's the question he posed himself, um, democratic recession turn into a democratic depression? Um, or is this just an aberration that we're seeing um, um, that will last a few years and then we'll get back on course um, onto the arc of history um, towards the liberal democracy that he originally forecast we would all arrive at. Um, you then have to look at the crisis within. Why within the West are we undergoing a crisis of liberal uh, democracy? Uh, so. It really goes back about 20, 25 years. Uh, if you judge the uh, measure of whether people have faith in the system to be who they vote for, um, you can really choose any democracy you like. Um, just for the sake of argument, I'll choose Germany, but the, there are two or three others I will mention. In the 80s, the 90s, Germany's two main parties, the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats, between them, uh, would get about 85 to 90 percent of the vote. That has just been dropping, dropping, dropping. Um, and last election um, in Germany in September, um, they got 53 percent of the vote between them. And the Social Democrats, as I say, as is the case in uh, pretty much every other Western democracy, um, are a ghost of their former self. Barely got a fifth. Barely got a fifth of the vote. You can um, translate that measure into the United States where if uh, in the 2016 primaries you had translated the votes for Bernie Sanders plus the votes for Donald Trump into congressional districts, then between them they would have a majority of congressional districts. This is something, this is something quite, quite new, but it's been, it's been building up for a while. Um, and those of you, you know, at which I again assume to be everybody who've been following presidential elections here will have seen that sort of rise in anti-establishmentism, that less lack of faith um, in the system, and that loss of trust for public institutions. And if you look at graphs across the Western world, um, whichever country you choose, those graphs show public trust going down. Some from a higher basis, Germany actually looks relatively good. Some from a lower one, the United States and Britain are particularly, are particularly bad. And when in a democracy you lose trust, uh, then you lose the lubricant that makes the system work. I've often said, quoting others, that um, the, the glue of uh, an autocracy is fear. That's what keeps autocracies going. Um, well, the glue of democracies is trust. And that trust barometer has been plummeting pretty steadily over the last half, uh, half to two-thirds of a generation. Um, when you lose trust, when you lose faith, you tend to turn either to agnosticism, you stop caring, you stop paying attention, 
He stopped voting, he stopped belonging to a political party, he stopped participating in civic activi activism. Or you um, uh, go one worse than agnosticism, you, you turn to atheism, you actually embrace um, a kind of nihilism. And I think if you, if you look at the, what I believe to be the fairly diabolic, but very, very effective um, and um, clever political methods that um, you've seen in many democracies, including, I believe, by the Trump campaign, um, you see a play on that nihilism. It's like, we do not believe in this system anymore. We are non-believers. We are atheists in this system. And you see people exploiting it very skillfully. Don't underestimate Trump's uh, skills. Um, so what is causing what is causing this cratering of trust, this decline of faith? Uh, well, there's this famous um, American sociologist, Barrington Moore, I think put it most simply, which is no bourgeoisie, no democracy. Um, if you don't have a middle, you don't have the glue, the stabilizing sort of center to politics um, in, in, in the economy, then politics um, will also start cratering in the middle. And we have seen um, really a hollowing out um, of the middle. Some people have been getting richer, uh, much richer. It's not that everybody in the middle who used to be in the middle has gone, gone down. Plenty have gone up. Um, but I think more have gone down than have gone up. Uh, and the idea that um, uh, you um, will reproduce the kind of growth rates you experience in income and opportunity and life chances for your children has been declining along with those trust in public institutions. And that's, that's a key part of it. I don't think you know, we need to sort of rehearse the stuff you know very well, what I call a triple cocktail of median wage stagnation, that the um, household median income is only about 20% higher today in real terms than it was in the late 70s. And in the late 70s, most households were single earner um, and today most a dual earner, um, and therefore that understates the degree of income loss. Um, more often than not, the woman is the one doing a lot of part-time jobs, and uh, more often than not, or as often as not, the man um, uh, can't hold on to the kind of job he used to think was his due. Then there's the second part of the triple cocktail, which is um, declining income mobility. Uh, one of the places you can now least easily realize the American dream is America. It's, it's harder to move up from the bottom decile of income to a top one in America than Germany, than Canada, and many other democracies, not than Britain. Um, uh, but in every country, it's less good than it used to be. And the third is kind of attached umbilically to the first two, which is rising inequality. Um, there is a distribution of wealth issue here, which is part of this loss of faith in the system. It's part of this sort of deeper um, problem of us not all being in it together. Um, so I think the two great trends uh, of, of democracy, the challenge from without globally, the democratic recession that Fukuyama talked about, and the crisis from within link up very, very clearly there in the slogan that you heard uh, during the Brexit referendum and that you heard variations of in many elections across the West, most recently Italy, but of course in Trump's victory in uh, 2016, which is take back control. Now at the macro level, the West is losing power. This is mostly um, a good thing um, because it's a product of other countries growing um, in the system, which you know some call Pax Americana, the system we created, others are getting less poor, people are dropping out of poverty. Um, something like 200,000 people a day get electricity around the world that never had it. Something like the same number every day get fresh drinking water that never had it. Um, so we have, uh, in economic terms, a very positive global story going on here where people are coming out of poverty um, at, a, at a, a rate never seen before in history, not just in China, but China's a large part of it. Um, uh, so we have a non-zero-sum game in economics. The richer Chinese get, the richer Indians get, the lower the illiteracy rate in these countries, the more we can sell and trade. Um, and at least in theory, enrich ourselves and become mutually prosperous. But geopolitics uh, is 
a zero-sum game. Um, when one gets more powerful, everybody doesn't get more powerful. Somebody else gets less powerful, and the West is losing power. Um, and there is no doubt about that. It's just a question of the degree and speed with which the center of gravity moves from west to east. And I think that that sense of the West sort of, after half a millennium of complete dominance, the West's declining hegemony um, links up um, really very viscerally with a lot of people um, in their daily lives, um, with their, their loss of control over their lives. Uh, maybe um, it's expressed in cultural, what's known euphemistically in cult as a cultural anxiety, but which you know, in, is often racist. It's often, you know, that guy outside the, um, the, the Hillary, the Hillary um, uh, rally in 2016 holding the sign, iron my shirts. Um, uh, but it's, uh, it's often also manifested in really quite troubling statistics, um, uh, such as a declining life expectancy amongst whole demographic swathes of this country and some others, including parts of Britain. Um, and in, of course, rising suicide rates and things like the opioid um, epidemic. Uh, so we have, I think, at that level um, and at the level of the West in history, a loss of control, a take back control urge um, that sort of links up uh, and creates a larger sense of a crisis of Western liberalism. Um, than, than simply looking at what individual voters' anxieties might be. Um, let me make two final points. Um, the first is that this is about politics. Uh, there's a recent book by Steven Pinker called uh, Enlightenment Now, which has received a lot of attention, um, in which he points out quite rightly some of the things I was citing, that the number of people in poverty is falling at a faster rate than ever, your chances of being killed in a homicide or dying in a war or from some mass epidemic are lower than they've ever been in history. And therefore, what are we complaining about? It's fine. We, we're, we're living in a crisis of plenty. Um, and I think he's absolutely right. Uh, I think that objectively speaking, all of the numbers he, he cites, the data he cites are correct. But we're dealing with uh, what, what Hegel called the crooked timber of humanity here. And humanity does, doesn't just think in terms of human development indicators. So if Pinker had come out with his book in 1938, he could have said exactly the same thing. He could have said, look at how we are compared to 1848. Immeasurably better off. Life expectancy immeasurably higher. Therefore, nothing's wrong. Stop panicking. And I think what he underestimates as a psychologist in particular, what he underestimates is how humans think and act, what motivates them to act, what status means to humans, and how that translates um, into politics. Now, I told you that um, you know, I have an enduring sense of tragedy being ar married to an Irish woman um, that sustains me through these temporary periods of joy. Um, my last book, um, which came out six years ago, um, was called uh, Time to Start Thinking, America and the Specter of Decline, which was very much about some of these issues, about the middle. Um, and uh, there, was a, there was a rather, uh, there was otherwise very friendly New York Times review of the book, which said it shouldn't be called Time to Start Thinking. It should be called Time to Start Drinking. Uh, and this was mid-2012. Obama was probably going to get reelected. Um, Liberals certainly thought it was a good time. It turns out he was re-elected. Um, America was four years into the recovery. Uh, and after he was re-elected, there would then be bipartisan action because the whole basis in his first term was to make him a one-term president. The fever would break, as Obama, um, as Obama himself said. The Republican fever would break. We would get bipartisan immigration deals. We would get... Um, infrastructure, all kinds of stuff, early learning bills, the kinds of things that most people who are in a reasonable frame of mind, whether they're conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat, would agree on, none of which happened. And the reason why I stuck to my sort of time to start thinking stroke drinking guns on this was because I saw it as a politics problem, uh, that uh, previous challenges in American history 
previous crises that had produced bipartisan action, such as um, the Great Depression, uh, Pearl Harbor, Sputnik, and so on, and 9-11, um, had galvanized bipartisan action through shock. These were single, clearly identified events that changed the nature of politics overnight and got the system working. Whereas the crisis that we're in, you can express in so many different ways. It's, it's like murder on the Orient Express. There are a lot of fingerprints on the dagger. You can talk about technology, you can talk about China, you can talk about trade, you can talk about male anxiety through loss of status. You can talk in America in particular about demographic, meaning white, um, non-college educated male anxiety. You can blame all kinds of people, but the last thing it is is a single event that stimulates bipartisan cooperation. It is a multi-layered and very complex um, set of challenges that we face that contribute to what I call um, the retreat uh, of Western liberalism. Uh, I don't want to conclude on too depressing um, a note, so I'll mention a battle over the title of this book, which as I say, it came out about a year ago. Um, um, it's called The Retreat of Western Liberalism, but my publishers, my publishers um, wanted to call it The Collapse of Western Liberalism. And I argued very strongly that we can't call it The Collapse because The Collapse implies it's over. Retreat implies we could regroup, that this is actually a politics problem, not a resources problem. We are not lacking resources. We're in an extraordinary golden age of plenty if you measure resources in absolute terms. This is a politics problem in the West. And I don't know whether 10 years from now, you know, I'll be writing a book called The Rebound of Western Liberalism, or whether I'll be writing a Fukuyama book called The Democratic Depression. I really don't know which it'll be. Um, so just as it, um, th th this is a human, this is a human, a human choice. This is to do with human action. This is to do with what we actually do in democracies, is make choices. Um, uh, and just as it's um, un unfortunately 129 years to go, uh, to, uh, ago today, it was Hitler's birthday. Um, very different vein, tomorrow um, it's Neve's birthday. So, different things can happen tomorrow. She's turning 31, by the way. Uh, um, so I want to leave you on a slightly less suicidal um, uh, note than which I began, um, which is this is in the realm of human action. Um, and if, uh, uh, if anybody disagrees or agrees, I'd love to entertain questions. So thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll take uh, questions from in the room or, or from online. If you have a question, please keep it to a question. Let's take a question in the front row here. That'll Just wait for the mic, thanks. Oh, Peter, yeah. So, Ed, what would it take for you to write that book about the rebound of Western liberalism 10 years from now? What would have to happen? Um, you know, partly it, it's, it's about anger. And there's a lot of anger in many democracies at the moment. And anger is to do with frustrated expectations. Uh, now, a lot of us know millennials, and they don't have the same expectations. So it might be we're just going to grow into this. Um, uh, I hope we grow into it with a little sort of stronger work ethic than a lot of millennials have. Um, but I do believe that they have more realistic expectations of what the West is and what they can achieve. And that might, uh, I think, you know, over time, um, change the tone of politics. Um, but there are very obvious things that we could do, which are not Republican or Democrat. They're, 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 they might be presented as such in this horrendously toxic way in which we debate things nowadays. But infrastructure was something Trump campaigned on. He, he, he also campaigned on training people. Um, and most Democrats, almost all Democrats, would agree with that kind of thing. Um, most people, you know, when they're not on Twitter and half drunk, agree on some kind of a sane immigration reform. Most Democrats agree there should be some control over borders, and most Republicans agree that we need talent and that there's a demographic issue that can be improved with immigration. So th it's not really, as I say, the policies that's the problem. It's the politics that's the problem. Next question. I have a question there from George Zemanides' father. Ah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, since I'm one of these deep state radio nerds that listens to you every week, except when you're on vacation, you spend a lot of time trying to educate people like us, and we're listening, we're, we're nodding our head, but w what's going to happen, what's the fate of Western liberalism when the citizenry, or the people who are supposed to be the Western liberals, don't know the traditions that are being undermined that keep Western democracy involved. I was, all of last week, I was in Washington, D.C., and members of the House on the Foreign Affairs Committee were incredulous that they were all getting hundreds of calls asking them to vote against Pompeo. I said, I don't have a vote on Pompeo. I'm in the House. Same thing with Gorsuch. What are we doing wrong? I mean, what I'd like to hear is not just the problem. Is there something we could do with our kids, with our grandkids, with our students? We're talking, we have an election here. We're talking about public education, but I never hear good, very good question. civics. So I mentioned Germany earlier, but Germany, you know, did cause a shock uh, last election because the AFD, uh, the far right, the alternatives for Deutschland got, broke through the 5% barrier where you get representation in Germany. They got almost 13% of the vote. It was a great shock. Um, first time since modern Germany was created, since the basic law, the constitution of Germany was promulgated in 1949, that that's happened. Um, but it's actually the least bad result we've had in the last three years. We have Brexit. You've, I mean, you know, I'm being fairly partisan here, but you've had Trump. Um, you had in the French elections 33% going to a fascist, essentially. Uh, Marine Le Pen, um, a reinvented fascist, but pretty clear what the party's message is. Um, Austria Freedom Party, which is a sort of postmodern far right party, got 28% in its legislative elections. Um, and the presidential election there for the fairly powerless presidency, they got 47%. Um, so the German result's not too bad. And what, so what can the German result tell us? Well, if you strip out former East Germany from the German result, AFD got far less than 10%. It's like seven, eight percent. In former East Germany, they got like a fifth of the vote. That's where the real alarm bells are flashing. And the same applies to Die Linke, the far left, um, which surged through that barrier too, not just the far right. Um, I think West Germany and Austria should be contrasted, and former West Germany and former East Germany should be contrasted. Austria doesn't have the civic education system that West Germany has had since 1940s. Neither has East Germany had that. Um, and uh, it's an incredibly serious, public, constant, ongoing endeavor that doesn't just include what they teach children, but includes the sort of rules of the ro road in terms of what are considered norms in West German politics. And you can sort of see it from the very first line of the German basic law. It doesn't say we the people like we do, or uh, most democracies do. It, it, it doesn't trust the people that much. It says human dignity shall be inviolable. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. And I think there's a lot to learn in terms of civics and beyond. But we could teach, you know, we teach to the test for math and English. We could teach for the, to the test for political literacy. Um, and civics. Um, so I think that's a good question. It's a much richer one than my answer suggests. So. Next question. On the far side there, please. Uh, uh, just to follow up on Europe, uh, what's your forecast in the next five, seven years happening to some European institutions like uh, um, the European Union or, or even to NATO? And if you talk about NATO, what's going to happen with Turkey, which is the one name you didn't mention. Yeah, Turkey Turkey's um, a very troubling example right now. As you probably noticed in the last couple of days, Erdogan is now calling snap elections in June. Um, and, and if he wins those, as he probably will, then the limits on his power are going to be pretty much invisible. Um, the European system, I could give a long answer, so I'll try and give a short answer. I mean, I see, tend to see it from my sort of provincial Brexit um, perspective, British pr perspective. Um, uh, and clearly, you know, in Britain, that's not going to be reversed. There's a lot of people fantasizing um, that we can have a referendum reversing Brexit. I don't think we want to see that happen. I didn't support Brexit. I think it's a serious blow, not just to Britain's economic prospects, but I think to Europeans, 
uh, European presence on the global stage. Um, but if there were that fantasy scenario that people like Tony Blair are trying to work for in Britain of a second referendum, and the Remainers won, they would win it 52-48, just like they lost it 48-52, and it would settle nothing. It, things would get deeper, more bitter, less governable. So I don't think, um, I don't think that Britain's going to rejoin the European Union. Italy is, you know, put five star as the largest party at its last election, um, and um, the second largest, actually the third technically, but a part of the largest bloc is the Northern League, both of which are pretty anti-Euro. Um, uh, it's confusing. They're not going to form a government for a long time. There might even be another election. But the direction Italy is going is against, um, is against Europe. Uh, the uh, real sort of cure for Europe and the motor of Europe has always been a Franco-German motor. It's always been those two countries cooperating. The great hope we have in democracy right now is Macron in uh, France. And his bet is he can get Germany to reform the European fiscal system and the rules of the European Monetary Union to try and make it counter-cyclical, which is what fiscal policy should be and monetary policy should be. Um, I in other words, not to punish club med countries like Italy um, uh, when they're down because it's bad economics and it's terrible politics. Unfortunately, the new German coalition is too weak, too unsure of itself, um, to, uh, I think, deliver on that side of the bargain. I think if Merkel had won strongly um, and had formed you know, a, a powerful Christian democratic government with maybe one partner, a small partner, she could be Macron's partner. But Macron's now kind of whistling in the wind. We're not going to get those sorts of reforms. So I'm a little bit pessimistic about the Eurozone's ability to stick together. A question from our online platform here about, about social media. Um, do you think that uh, social media has it kind of accelerated the decline of or the retreat of Western liberalism, or is it just showing us what was kind of already underneath the surface? Uh, again, that's a very complex one, which I don't want to give too long an answer to, but, I mean, there's a great Timothy Snyder quote, um, um, post-truth is pre-fascist. Um, and, of course, there's the wonderful old Mark Twain quote about the lie has gone several times around the world or halfway around the world before truth has put its boots on. Um, and we are living in that, in that kind of moment. I tend to think at times that we blame Russia a bit too much for the fake news that was generated in the last election. Uh, the problem is really about the demand for fake news. And so I liken it to the war on drugs. You can burn poppy fields and stuff in Colombia. You can shut down Sputnik and RT and some Russian bots. Um, but whilst we still keep believing nonsense, and, you know, sharing it amongst people who are entirely like-minded on right and left and elsewhere, uh, the, uh, there's, uh, it's really a problem of demand mm -hmm. for fake news, of, cre of uh, cre credulousness amongst electorates, um, rather than who's supplying it. But it, I, I mean, you know, I guess it makes, it makes it a much more dramatic situation that there is a foreign power actively aiding this. Mm -hmm. A question from in the room, the very back row there, Maddie. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Maybe I'm okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, sorry about that. Um, uh, thank you for mentioning Macron a moment ago. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about leadership. Um, is this more of a question of, like, you mentioned the reaction of the U.S. to 9-11, uh, the reaction of the U.S. to the financial crisis. If we were to get new leadership, would would that be something that would be helpful, or is it more of a question of leadership being a reflection of what's been going on and a reflection of the world as we see it? Well, to a certain extent, I think we get the politics we deserve. I mean, I, I was actually sort of dreading in, in uh, the fall of 2016 a Hillary victory um, because I think she would have been, she would have had impeachment proceedings begin against her straight away. She would have had inquiries coming out of her ears, investigations, congressional probes, and so forth. And she would have found it impossible to get anything done. Um, and there would have been a, a sort of Weimar Republic feel about a Hillary Clinton presidency. So I'm not sure we're necessarily in a worse scenario with Donald Trump as president, believe it or not. 
Um, I think um, I think the fact that he won and that we can see the consequences and measure it is the sort of closest way or the fastest route to understanding the consequences of decisions. Um, when the Democratic Party earlier this year broke out into a brief fantasy about Oprah Winfrey becoming its nominee in 2020, I did worry deeply because, you know, however partisan and toxic the climate is, what we're seeing is what political scientists call asymmetric polarization. The, you know, the Republican Party has polarized, moved to the right far quicker than the Democrats have moved to the left. They're now beginning to really move to the left. Um, they're Bernie Sanderizing, I think. Um, and the idea that uh, the lesson of Trump's victory is that celebrity wins um, for a party that still retains some faith in expertise and facts and fact checking and holding things up to reason debate. Um, that would be, I think, to signal not just to America, but to the world that we no longer take politics seriously here. Um, now, you know, I, I do not for a moment wish to equate Oprah Winfrey with Donald Trump. You know, if, if, if there were a vote, um, you know, between Trump and, and, and Oprah Winfrey, I hope she'd win 100% in a sort of North Korean style election. Um, I, I would choose her every time. But she is, you know, the uh, apostle, um, not the apostle, kind of the uh, messiah of a, a magical new age thinking that has nothing to do with how public policy should be conducted. And I think it would be a sort of ultimate victory of Trump in a funny way if Oprah Winfrey were, were the nominee. Let's stick on that back row up there. Thanks, Maddie. Um, just um, briefly, just you can share your thought about the Trump trade policy and what would be the impact, like global impact, and also I'm thinking more long-term impact on the domestic uh, economy. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, I think people understandably blame trade and therefore China for the, some of the economic, um, most of the economic insecurity and stagnation that we've been experiencing in the last, you know, since China, China joined the WTO. And so it sort of fits. China joined the WTO in 2001. And the 2001 to 2006, 2007 business expansion under Bush Jr. was the first in American history where the median household income was actually lower at the end of it than at the beginning. And so, you know, there's this sort of fits, there's this symmetry with China's rise um, and people's feeling of economic insecurity. But in actual fact, 90% of this is technology. And globalization is enabled by technology. Um, people have talked about having a tax on robots. Robots would just go elsewhere and people would, would out-compete us. It sounds, it's one of those sexy sort of policy okay. suggestions. So Trump, as you know, in his first week, withdrew America from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. As you probably also know, the TPP does not include China. It includes Japan and Australia and Indonesia and countries like that and Chile uh, and Mexico. Um, and it is there to set global standards um, in, in stone to such a degree that China feels obliged to join them. Trump pulled the plug from TPP. He's flirted once or twice with rejoining, but it's not going to happen. Um, uh, and China has therefore been able to pick off and pick people off. Britain's Brexit, of course, helps that. Britain's desperate for a bilateral trade deal with China now. Um, uh, Trump um, wants American trade deals to be bilateral because America will always be the overwhelmingly powerful part of this bilateral negotiation. Naturally, nobody wants to conduct those kinds, of except Britain, <laughs> because Britain's, uh, Britain, Britain has left the largest market in the world. Um, so, um, it it's, makes great sense politically, Trump's trade strategy, but it makes no sense economically or geopolitically in terms of bringing China into um, a global system to abide by and support rules that we would like it to. Um, so I, I'm not a fan of Trump's trade policy, but I'm an admirer of his politics. He's very clever. On the, on the far side, in the gray suit, thanks, Lynn. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, you mentioned responses to financial crises uh, a couple times in passing. I was hoping you could expand more. Um, so you described the response to 2008 as one, I mean, potentially with 
somewhat ineffectual populist backlash, weak regulation, regulatory response, and, and ultimately, maybe as a side effect, the rise of, of China and other Eastern powers. What's the difference there between 2008 and the Depression, which resulted in a more focused populist backlash in Glass-Steagall, which is a stronger regulation and, and decades of growth, or at least growth-focused policies? Look, it's very, very hard um, to talk about American politics without including both race and class. And if you look at the New Deal coalition, you look at what Roosevelt did, he brought the Southern Democrats along with him um, by excluding agricultural workers and domestic labor from things like social security. So Dixiecrats were with him because African-Americans were not beneficiaries of it. Now, the Tea Party began um, not um, with the bailout of Detroit, not even with TARP, although the ground had been softened up before Obama was elected with TARP when the first vote again went against it. Um, the Tea Party um, happened when Tim Geithner, as then Treasury Secretary, announced a fairly modest mortgage subsidy plan to help people whose homes were underwater in foreclosure restructure their mortgages. And there was this very effective political outcry about undeserving people getting bailed out. Um, it wasn't actually Goldman Sachs being bailed out that caused this populism. And I think, you know, we cannot ignore the fact that um, it was a Treasury Secretary for America's first black president announcing this assistance, very modest, we're talking about a $50 million program here, um, for the undeserving poor um, that, that explains the difference in building a coalition in the 1930s and a coalition in the 2010s. That's part of it, but that's not all of it. Um, that said, though, and I do, I haven't mentioned race much up until now, but it is, you know, there was an ABC Washington Post poll last week that broke down Trump's pretty relatively high approval ratings, considering um, those who live in the anti-Trump bubble, what they think, everybody thinks, um, you know, that he's got a 42% approval ratings, but he has 53% approval of whites, 53% of whites approve. 11% of blacks and 16% of Hispanics. Um, and you see those numbers polarize all the time. So, you know, one of the reasons I worry is because American politics is racializing more and more. Um, and the Republican Party is basically becoming the white party. Um, they're not reaching out to Hispanics, let alone African Americans. Um, and the Democrats, you know, are basing more and more um, on identity politics, which is the flip side of the coin. Um, and I, it, those conditions are the least good for New Deal ki kind of pragmatism, you know, bold, persistent experimentation, the kinds of things that FDR did to dig America out of the, out of the Great Depression. Um, so you can't leave race out of, out of the answer. It's not the ex exclusive answer, don't get me wrong. And I don't think everybody who voted for Trump is deplorable at all. Um, um, but uh, it, it's becoming more of a factor um, uh, than it was a few years ago. Uh, just here, Maddie, thanks. Excellent presentation, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I get that a lot of the impetus for these shifts uh, has involved a general sense of grievance and anger at loss of status and so forth, but don't don't politicians eventually have to deliver? Things like the trade policy and the health care policy and the tax policy will, help, will hurt Trump supporters uh, much more than uh, most other people. I mean, eventually, won't they stop voting against their self-interest? Um, I mean, there's quite, that's quite a heavily freighted question, um, <laughs> which I understand. Um, but you know, there are people on the left in journalism in academia who vote against their economic self-interest, right? They vote for higher taxes. Um, so if people on the right, um, you know, are voting for lower spending and they're blue collar, right, in red states, um, and they are therefore voting against their economic self-interest for other reasons, for cultural, for values, for philosophy, why are they more irrational than us voting against our economic self-interest? I think the calling them crazy argument is what will lead to democratic defeats um, again and again. I think we have to understand what Trump appealed to, um, not to 
provide a B-team imitation, pale imitation of it, not for a second to justify the racism and misogyny in it, but to understand that that racism and misogyny is exploited because of deep feelings of insecurity and anxiety, and people don't sort of lose life expectancy like that unless there's a profound crisis of morale. And the Democrats have to learn to understand this. And calling people irrational is not the way to do it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not picking on you. I, I understand entirely the premise of your question. Um, but saying people don't know their own interests, I think people do know their own interests. I think that a lot of Trump voters do not believe government can deliver. I'm kind of sort of, I'm not undercutting the answer I've just given to you. But I'm trying to sort of enlarge on it. Um, and give a different, um, a different sort of perspective on it. But people do know their own economic interests and sometimes other feelings trump those interests. Um, so the solution to this is for the Democratic Party to think very differently than this game of demograph demographic addition that it seems to be set on. Um, and just one example of why I think this is a mistaken path is uh, the biggest argument you hear cited is the growth of Hispanics, that with each election there will be a bigger and bigger portion of the electorate. Um, but if you um, look at surveys of Hispanics, um, a majority of Hispanics consistently say that if the census gave them the choice, they would define themselves as white American. And that they're not necessarily liberal. A lot of them are actually, you know, um, immigrants from countries that have tradition of strong men and authoritarianism, a lot of them have um, a dislike for some of the liberal values, you know, would, would have been on the Trump side of the transgender bathroom issue, for example, and so forth. That if Democrats keep thinking, we don't need to bother really too much with them because they're, Trump's doing all our work for us, we might be misreading it. A very final sort of tiny point, I spent uh, two, three days in a town called Hazleton, Pennsylvania in the 2016 election because it's 50% Hispanic. It's a sort of Rust Belt town. And in the year 2000, it was 7% or something like that Hispanic. It's gone from zero to 60 miles an hour in a few years. And they're Dominican Hispanic. And so I asked them about immigrants. Were they against Trump? And they said, well, first of all, we're not immigrants. We came from the Bronx. We came from Patterson, New Jersey. We're American. We came from another state. And second of all, we're not illegal Mexicans. We're not going to vote. Um, Hillary hasn't been here. We haven't seen the Hillary campaign here. Then I asked all the generally older white people in town. They were all wearing badges. I'm a deplorable. And I thought then, although I you know, didn't write it strongly enough because I didn't predict the outcome of the election, I thought then Hillary's lost. Um, you know, they, they are assuming these people are in their column. And it's kind of, it, you know, it's kind of, there is a sort of disrespect implicit in that assumption in, in identity politics that I don't think it's going to serve those who rightly want to defeat Trump very well. Sorry, I would, you, it sounds like I'm picking an argument with you. I, I, I enjoyed your question. Time for just one more question. How about over there at the front? Thanks. Uh, hi, Ed. Uh, I spent uh, a lifetime trying to breach uh, a style of Western democracy to uh, in the Middle East and to Islamic groups, particularly militant Islam sometime. And uh, when we look now and uh, we see Peng in China or Erdogan in Turkey, and to a lesser degree maybe uh, before Lee Kuan Yew in, uh, in Singapore and so on, uh, and what they like to call a just dictator or good dictators. Uh, and then we, we get the crisis of retreat of Western liberalism, having a Trump and the Brexit, uh, and the delusional of uh, delusions now of uh, Western democracy. How can I still preach uh, to these groups, particularly rebel groups in Syria and others, uh, a style of democracy, citizenship, inclusiveness, and so on? Well, I mean, I imagine that people who, I don't know Syria, and you do, I know you do, um, but I imagine that people in Syria, given the choice in private, would not be voting for Assad, right? I mean, it's, so it's not like we're, they're clinging to that model as a superior one. Um, I imagine people in your country, Egypt, would not be voting for Sisi, um, you know, if there was a really ge genuine choice on offer. And I know that, you know, the one place left from the Arab Spring, Tunisia, where there is still something like, something like a parliamentary democracy, um, that people do feel that they're better off than they were before. I do think in the long run, um, Fukuyama will be right. Um, but the long run, you know, 
we're all dead, as Lord Keynes said. Lots of stuff happens in between. And secondly, you know, we, we, can't, we can't afford a generation of trying to justify this system um, by preaching it to others. We have to demonstrate it at home that it works. Um, and that means rebuilding people's faith in the system, that it isn't a bunch of elites rigging it for themselves. It's not like you know the Ivy League admissions process. It's actually a real sort of open meritocratic system, um, and so that's that's a that's a deep, that's a deep um, and very important task, and I understand why nobody in America really wants to get involved in Syria. It's a tragedy, what's happening in Syria. Deep tragedy. I hope it will force people in the region to step up, like Egypt. Um, and do the kinds of things maybe America would have done in the past. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Please stick around and uh, for the reception and grab a copy of the book. Uh, and join me in thanking Edward Luce.